Welcome to the Three Knockdown Rule. Starring Mario Lopez and Steve Kim. Presented by Hustler Casino and UFC Fight Pass. Ladies and gentlemen, the three knockdown rule on UFC Fight Pass is in effect. I'm Steve Kim, joined by Mario Mars Bar Lopez. It's Halloween. Ah. Trick or treat. <laughs> dude, you went 80s. Yeah, do they even make Mars Bars? Anymore? I've not seen think, that in years, I'll be I don't honest think with they, you. I don't think they make Mars Bars yeah. anymore. But you know what? I'm a big full candy bar giver. Yeah. Oh, wow. Wow. You wanted to go trick or treating around Casa Lopez. Oh. And we've got smoking Tim Frazier. Right you look like you were going to follow up. we got smoking Tim Frazier right here. And our boy in person, Tino, Tino on the edits. All right, let's get started. The bout sheet for this week's show. Furry Nganu, uh, Battle of the Baddest. And also a shock treatment in Cancun, Mexico. And then scheduled to join us in studio, El Presidente Eric Gomez of Golden Boy Promotions and Ask Mario. But first, we want to let you know this show, this podcast is sponsored by Hustler Casino, located in Gardena, California, just 20 minutes away from downtown L.A. Check out the latest promo, So Fine Sundays, where they're giving away tons of cash, beat the stadium traffic, and play your favorite games at Hustler Casino. For more info, go to HustlerCasino.com. Also, big shout out to our guy, uh... Oscar over at Scout Micro LA. He's got a company that offers a unique and innovative hair loss solution for men. A lot of men are struggling and dealing with that. It basically replicates the exact shape, shape and size of the hair follicles by tattooing tiny particles of pigment into the scalp, which gives the illusion of hair. You will always look thick. When you got this hookup, you can see results as little as one treatment. They create and restore hairlines, make it look a little more dense. You can rock that close crop hairstyle. If you've got scars or uh, you want to camouflage burns or any sort of skin conditions around the scalp, it can really help you out in all seriousness. And they use the highest qualities of tools. Or if you're just going bald, looking for a new look, call our homies over at Scalp Micro LA and you mention this ad for a free consult. If you're getting thin, he'll help fill you in. Round one. All right, let's get started. <laughs> Saturday from cool. Saudi Arabia, the battle of the baddest and what, what was a stunning, not upset, but a result. Tyson Fury ekes out a close split decision in 10 rounds over Francis Ngannou. Your scores, 95-94, 95-94 for Ngannou, and then 96-93 for Tyson Fury. Mario, um, did Tyson Fury... Lose in winning. Yes, is is the short answer. Where I was going to go with it initially, remember in Rocky, when Duke says, he thinks it's a damn show. <laughs> or he thinks it's a real fight. He don't know it's a damn show. <laughs> That's exactly what was going on right here. I, I was, I'm even hesitating to putting it in words right now because I'm watching it, right? And I'm thinking... Okay, Tyson Fury's always built like a bag of milk. I'm not going to judge his physique. Clearly, he didn't train hard for this fight. I don't even think he prepared at all from what I'm hearing. He didn't really train at all because he thought a complete novice uh, coming in, he'll have his way with him. Yes, if that's a complete novice who wasn't an athletic physical specimen like Nganu, who, by the way, did box a little back in the day and was arguably one of the best heavyweight champions in MMA. It's not like he's not used to combat, okay? We should have factored that in, Tyson Fury. But he went in there, I think, with zero preparation, and he looked it. Meanwhile, Nganu is looking like he's carved out of granite and some sort of Greek god. I'm watching it in the first couple rounds. I'm like, all right, because he kind of he kind of put a nice combination together in the first round against Nganu. Nganu just took it. He, my guy's got a set of whiskers on him. Of course, he's got a neck like a Brahma bull. And then when he hit him with a flush right hand and he didn't move, I said, okay. And then in the third round when he dropped him, I said, uh -oh. is he, is this real? I didn't know if he was initially sort of kind of carrying him. Because when I, I actually spoke with Floyd Mayweather, um, I don't know if I ever told you this, back in the day when he fought with Conor McGregor, and I could have just been saying this, but he, he talked about I had to carry him for a few rounds before you know I had to do my thing, right? I thought which is very conceivable. I thought that was going to be the same case here. But I don't care who you are. You're never going to let yourself get dropped. 
like that. And those were real bruises, and that was a real black eye at the end. And then I saw Nganu trying to initiate action, put punches together, and I go, Are we, is this Rocky? I mean, what is going in? I, what is happening? It wasn't like it was a great fighter or Nganu was doing anything incredibly special, but he looked comfortable. He looked like he actually kind of belonged in there. And it was such an under, one incredibly underachieved, the other overachieved. And it got really interesting when it was at the end because I was like, what did I just watch? It was bad for Tyson Fury. It was bad for the sport of boxing. The only thing it was good for was Nganu himself, who's the nicest guy, and I'm so glad he got paid handsomely, and Fury's um, wallet. Outside of that, it left me scratch scratching my head. I feel like I was had. What happened? It was a weird thing to process. With all that said... I think since Nganu exceeded expectations, he didn't win, and I did. I wasn't judging it, but after thinking about it and watching, I think I did have Fury because of the last two rounds winning. Okay, a huge underdog that exceeds those sort of expectations. I think everyone's going to rally and say that he won, or, or crying out robbery, robbery. But robbery is a strong word. I don't necessarily uh, agree with that. I, I think that Fury looked like a shadow of himself. I think he looked like a guy that didn't undertrain. And it was a terrible night for him. And I think if he put just a little work in, he probably could have had his way with him. But I think, Kim, he went in there. This was, he thought it was like Rocky versus Thunderlips. It was the show before the real fight with Usyk. And I think a highly motivated Fury would be a much different beast to face than a fattened up, out of shape, I didn't prepare Fury. He, he's a manic depressive guy who's got issues. And I think he went in there for the payday. And he thought it was just going to be that, a show and a payday. He didn't realize that Nganu was a serious customer that came to fight. Am I wrong in this assessment? I will say this. I want to have a mea culpa. I thought it'd be a blowout. That'd be one-sided. Nganu, I'm going to eat some crow. You're better technically than I thought. And I thought what was interesting was that Tyson Fury, at times, being the guy in his natural habitat in a boxing ring, he was actually more fidgety. He was actually more uncomfortable because Nganu had more layers to his game. He actually went south, Paul, and Fury kind of looked like, hmm, what do I do with this guy? What was interesting to me and what happened was what didn't happen. The second half surge, right. the technical acumen. I thought eventually Fury would say, okay, let's get down to business. I owe this guy something. It never really happened. And when the 10th round ended, I said, you know what? I'm not really sure who won this fight, and I'm not calling it a robbery either. But I will say this, and I tweeted it, and a lot of the Tyson Fury jock sniffers and all his groupies got upset. Uh, I don't ever want to hear his name among the all-time greats. Can we just stop with that? I cannot imagine any type of real heavyweight from Lennox Lewis to Muhammad Ali to Joe Lewis to Joe Frazier, even Ron Lyle, uh, Ernie Shaver, struggling with a mere novice and he got banged up tyson fury this cult that exists that says he's among the greatest ever no he's really good in a weak era and if you really look at his resume let's just really examine this okay he beats vladimir klitschko he takes two years off then he gets a lot of credit for being a dangerous but flawed deontay wilder and now keep this in perspective mario his last three fights have come against an older dillian white an older, decrepit Derek Chisora, and now Francis Ngannou. That doesn't exactly say to me, wow, there's an all-time great heavyweight. Okay, look, you're being a prisoner of the moment. Pump the brakes for a second. Like I said, we're dealing with oh, I guy. Can, wait, wait, those who said he was an all-time great were the ones who were the prisoner of the moment. Listen, God's honest this, truth. No, this is, this, is what, this is what I would say, and I don't think you would disagree with this. A highly motivated, well-trained and prepared Tyson Fury, the Fury that fought wilder the second time okay isn't that when he knocked him out yeah. like in the first that fury is a handful for any heavyweight because of his size because of because of the dimensions that he's he's quick he's frigid he's still mm. fluid that sort of 
The thing is, you don't know what kind of fury you're getting. We're dealing with the guy who's ahead. We just saw the documentary Fury, the guy that's I been didn't. doing his Netflix show. I'm sick of his act. I no, didn't watch it. No, 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 second. no. You're not listening to me. What we saw in the ring was the Netflix documentary Fury, the guy that didn't care, the guy that didn't prepare. That's what I'm trying to tell you. We saw he's he's his own worst enemy. That's who we saw this past Saturday night because he had the same attitude we did. He should just be able to wash this guy. But as we know, this is not your normal guy in there. I still think a really well-prepared, highly motivated, in-shape Fury causes problems for any okay. heavyweight out there. That's all I'm saying. Well, with that I think point, it's too. I don't think you can say I'll it affects never, his, lev- his uh, legacy. Kim. You're making up a lot of excuses. I'm not making excuses. And, I'm being. I'm being honest. Do not, you're not being honest. Um, I remember one time I got a 68. I got like a D minus on a test, and I said to the teacher, "Hey." When I'm motivated, when I really study, when I actually open up the textbook and go through it, I'm a much better student. And you know what the teacher said? Great. Mm-hmm. Next time, you'll get better than a D minus. You don't grade on a curve. I cannot really. I'm not I grading on a curve, kid. Yes, you're talking. You no, I'm not. Yes, you're talking you about. You're talking about the, his legacy. You know what, I don't think it affects. You know what a measure of greatness is? Consistency. I agree with you, but in fighting, as you know, it's a little different because it's legacy. Muhammad Ali struggled against right. fucking Lyle Alzado. And, that, and, and yeah, you know, you're gonna hurt that. You're gonna hurt. Uh, hold that against and, him. Well, you he know struggled against Aoki. Are you gonna hold that Here's against the thing, him? We don't make excuses. Well, though. that's what I'm saying, though, Kim. You don't hold that against. You know what? I never seen a record book. Hold on a second. I don't make. I make excuses for that night. You're making a lot. No, I'm not. I'm talking. About about his legacy. I'm talking about his legacy. What about his legacy? It's different. He's okay. He's good it, for this you know era. What I'm saying? He's it's good different. for this era. You know one thing I never seen a record book box wreck? A lot of asterisks. The result is the result. I agree. Like when James Tony I had, I don't think he had a very good camp against Roy Jones. But you know what I don't see? All I see is an L12. But the asterisk doesn't say, well, James blew up, didn't train, and then like he really no, shouldn't have right. been in there, and he wasn't mentally focused. The result is the result. And my, my view is this. He I had agree. plenty of time to get ready for this fight. He got paid a pretty good amount of money, right? What happened to the professional responsibility? All-time greatness also means that you are consistent and you are reliable. The only thing I can really judge, because I'm not in that camp, I'm not his trainer, I'm not his handler, what do I see on that day when you are performing when the lights are on? That's the only thing that matters. You can go out there and rationalize, well, this time he was kind of motivated, this time he really wasn't, this time he was kind of like in the dumps mentally, doesn't matter. It's about the results and the performance. That's all that really matters. At the end of the day, correct. But all I'm saying is, when you're comparing him to the all-time greats, I'm saying he is a formidable opponent. He is because of the size. On. That's what it's all I'm saying. That's and, all I'm saying. And I've also known That's that he's saying. been he's ha- he's had some moments where I'm like, mm, look, here's the issue: in an era where you're able to cherry pick opponents and then take long, t- t- long stretches of time off, and then sanctioning bodies don't do their jobs. The thing with Tyson Fury is that his fan base they always make excuses. Every time he looks bad. You know what? That's not the real world. That's not the way it should be. The bottom line is this. If you are a guy that says, I am the heavyweight champion of the world. I'm the baddest fighting man in the world. You take care of Nganu. There is no excuses. Honestly. Listen. Listen. I'm not arguing with that. Ironically, can I tell you, it's whetted my appetite more for Fury Usyk. And now I'm Hmm. like... I, does it make you want to see it more? Because now I think Usyk has mine maybe a real chance. Whereas before, I honestly didn't think I gave him that much of a chance. Now I'm like, shoot, I think Usyk could actually make some history here. And he could, is this the, the starting the demise? Or Fury can get himself in the type of shape he's supposed to be in. And maybe he erases all of this by a dominant performance. And by the way. But now I'm intrigued to see what's going to happen. Well, first of all, regarding, that <laughs> um, regarding that fight, though. But again, once again, Tyson Fury with the double talk. Yeah. Um, this fight was supposed to happen December 23rd. They had a binding contract. Fury himself said he cannot get out of it. He must fight me December 23rd, right after the fight. Oh, I had a long camp, him and his promoter. Oh, long camp, we're tired. So wait a minute. So did he train or not? Hate that. So did you overtrain and, and leave it all in the gym or not then? Because they're going against your own word then. So me, right? I agree he with said you. himself that he that, that, that was a long camp and all that. Okay, what dude, is it? he's a flaky guy, dude. I told you from the beginning I didn't have a problem with this fight if he for sure takes that Usyk fight. I said that. If he for sure takes that. You want to go get your money, Greg? He's like in the late Mayweather stages now doing these novelty fights. Go get in the bag, as the kids would say. Fine. But hold, don't hold up the belt and, and fulfill your duties. I said he didn't, right. I didn't have a problem if he does it. Now I'm getting pissed we, off if he doesn't go through with this. We have to be fair about this. If Floyd Mayweather would have struggled 
as much as Fury did against Conor McGregor, none of us would be bringing up, well, Floyd wasn't focused. Floyd didn't care. Floyd had, no, we would. We'd just say, man, you really struggled against an MMA guy. You know, Let's be consistent well, in you that. Well, you know what I can say consistently? I've always said, regardless of what I speak about Floyd, Floyd my dude is always in shape. Yep. He lives in the gym. He lives a clean lifestyle, regardless of how he yep. carries himself. That dude is consistently in shape. You never have to worry about him not uh, being uh, well-conditioned and, and on point. But Fury, my dude, puts on like literally 80 pounds between fights, so it's a whole different animal. That dude, it's and different. it's the same thing, that, and it's the, what I've said about Bernard Hopkins. Discipline is a skill. Absolutely. People have to stop discounting that. No, That absolutely. lifestyle, discipline, and focus, it's as every bit as important as size, speed, power. Agree. Uh, speaking of a fight, and unfortunately this was overshadowed with everything that went on in Saudi Arabia, later on Saturday night from Cancun, and it was no vacation spot for either one of these men, on the zone, uh, and still the WBC 130-pound belt holder Oshaki Foster down on the scorecards, not looking good in Mexico, rallies in dramatic fashion, stopping the rugged Rocky Hernandez in 12. Mario, I think this fight will be invited to the banquet for fighter of the year or fight of the year. Round 11, uh, bronze it and put it on the mantle. What a three minutes. Wow. On the heels of the Rocha Santian fight, which I really like, and now this fight, back to back, great, great um, fights. That especially with the the debacle, which it really wasn't. It was even a great fight. I wouldn't even talk about that. And we'll get into the attendance. I want to talk about that later in Saudi Arabia. But this fight, man, back and forth, Cancun, right? Yes, I was Cancun. Nick Van Exel's favorite yeah, spot in the dude, off season, dude. I can't believe you brought up that reference. <laughs> That's old school. Reference. One, two, three, Cancun. I know. Um, <laughs> Uh, wow, man, my guy, and then that 11th round, that was, I keep making Rocky references, but that was that sort was of Rocky. Rocky. That, that was Rocky esque, and the way he dropped him and then ended up coming back in the 12th round, he showed some real grit there going into uh, south of the border and in the back and forth. He, I think he allowed, I don't know if it was necessarily the moment or the crowd or the Latinos to kind of get the best of him because. Um, Hernandez seemed to be letting his hands go a little bit more, seemed to be winning a lot of the battles, and was just sort of out hustling him. And then he started to counter nicely and started to land his shots and assert himself. And obviously, it all came to fruition in the 12th round. But what a fantastic fight, uh, especially that one round had a lot more action than most fights uh, out there. So it was nice to have that on the heels of of the novelty that was in the Middle East. Oshaki Foster is a man without a promoter, a man without a network, but he had a belt. And I always said belts matter. So this is why they yeah, brought him over, probably made some money. I thought it was interesting. In round 11, the first 90 seconds, I said, you could stop this. You could stop it. And then it got turned around. Hmm. And I'm thinking, okay. But I still thought he won the round, but it wasn't 10-8. In my view, Hernandez did enough to make it 10-9. And I'm kind of doing the math thinking, Hernandez is probably ahead, but I think the margin is shrinking. I thought Foster had won about four, maybe five rounds, and Hernandez probably had about six or maybe seven in the bank. And this is what I found interesting in terms of the strategic battle. Hernandez, every time he tried to box and go backwards, I thought he left himself more vulnerable. In my view, he was better off smothering and just grabbing and being chest to chest because when there's a little bit of distance... That's when he got clipped by the faster hands of Oshaki Foster. Yes, however, ironically, I think it was him pressuring him and having that head in the chest and letting his hands go that might have exerted himself and therefore the punch resistance, he wasn't able to have all his legs come that 12th round. Yeah, and you talk about home canvas advantage. In my view, after the first knockdown in round 12, you could have stopped it. Mm -hmm. And then for about 35, 40 seconds, I'm thinking, you know what? You could stop this at any time. I wouldn't have had a problem. Right. And then when the second knockdown count, I wouldn't have even started the count because I think at this point, it's getting very dangerous for Rocky Hernandez. But I really like Oshaki Foster. Very productive year. He beats one of the most difficult, ugly fighters in the world to face, Ray Vargas. Then he has to go to mm -hmm. Mexico and to beat a guy in Rocky Hernandez, all the cards are stacked against him rugged style it was not easy and to rally here's a statistic from the great steve farhood he mentioned on twitter there's only been 14 times in modern boxing history where a fighter who's down on the scorecards has scored a last round knockout to bail themselves out and in many respects it kind of reminded me of a fight that i remember watching on usa calvin groves went to mexicali and was winning pretty handily against jorge paez 
Paya scored three knockdowns, and I believe it was a 15-round fight to capture the belt. This was wow. incredibly dramatic. 15. And we talk about belts mattering. Eddie Hearn was the promoter of this fight. I think he's going to make a deal with Oshaki Foster. And this week in Monte Carlo on the zone, Joe Cordina, pretty good fighter, has the IBF belt. He fights Edward Vasquez in Monte Carlo on the zone. So again, Oshaki Foster may have to be the road warrior from Mexico, maybe to Europe. But hey, a payday is a payday, and you have a chance to really make a career. Also, Good one note him. before we move on here. Saturday on ESPN Plus from Lake Tahoe, brought to you by Top Rank, Effie Ajagba and Raymond Murataya co-headline a card. So, all right, we come back on the three knockdown rule. Scheduled to join us in studio, the president of Golden Boy Promotions, El Presidente, Eric Gomez. Welcome to the big leagues, kid. $1.2 million. Oh. <laughs> and I'm losing in this fucking game. What the fuck? This is a 400k flip. If I win by way, you get 10 grand. Come for my fucking straddle! For my fans! What? I ran it twice! Wow! All in in a call. I'm not fucking leaving! Raise it up! We're back here on the three knockdown rule on UFC Fight Pass. And we just want to let you know if you want to get involved with the three knockdown rule and sponsor our fine program, we still have some slots available. Please reach out to us by emailing info at boxbid.io. Once again, that's info at boxbid.io. Boxbid.io is an online platform that is launching soon that helps public figures and professionals in the world of boxing get sponsorships. We are proudly working <clears throat> with BoxBid.io. And Mario, a return visit from one of the friends of our program. A hey, good friend and an awesome gentleman. Little salute, little Casa Mexico tequila taste to my guy, Eric Gomez, Hola, president hey. of Golden Boy Promotions. President. This is our new uh, standard right here. Mm. Salute, homie. Salute, ah. salute. I, Eric, walk, Eric walked in. I said, hey, dude, are you on Ozempic? Because you're looking all, <laughs> <laughs> losing all kinds of weight. You've been training, huh? I've been training, man. I'm just trying to catch up to you and Oscar. Good for you. Hey, yeah, yeah, yeah. hey spe speaking of Oscar, he, along with, it seems like, every other star on the planet, was in um, Saudi Arabia this past weekend, man. I haven't talked to him. Have you talked to him since? Yeah, he, yeah, yeah. How, yeah, yeah, how yeah. did he say it was? He just said it was incredible. You know, it seemed like they didn't have a budget. It was like unlimited. Bro, it did. It, it seemed like, yeah. well, they really don't have a budget over there. Those guys just kind of <laughs> Did you know money. the undercard was in another arena? Yeah. Really? Yeah, yeah, so they had an undercard arena, and then everyone had to go a mile and a half because of the big stage. They had that halftime show that took a whole football oh, game. Oh, wow, that's right. Yeah. That was pretty elaborate. It's pretty <laughs> elaborate. I mean, just to see the who's who was kind of a really cool sort of event. To see the Middle East get behind boxing so much. and yeah. I mean, I got them at great for the sport, right? It was great. It was like our Super Bowl. Mm. Uh, you had everybody there, you know, with the exception of Floyd. I don't think Floyd was there or Canelo. Oh, that's mm. right. They're the only one or the Klitschko's. Huh. Right. But that's it. Everybody else was there. Everybody else, <laughs> Everybody was, else there. was there. And yeah. what did you think of the event itself and Fury and um, the way... I mean, the showed. event was incredible. I mean, it was incredible. Um, we were well, well represented for, you know, for the world of boxing. Um, and the fight was a lot better than expected. It sure was. Dude, it, it surprised me. I was telling Kim, I said, it, 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 it's almost like that Rocky movie where... He tells Rocky, you know, he, he doesn't know it's a damn show. He thinks it's an actual fight. I think Fury mm -hmm. went in, not trained. Homie just did his Netflix show. He always looks sloppy, so you can't really judge him on his body. Yeah. But he thought this dude, he was just going to go out there and and, and, and and spank him up. But in Ganu, it's not like he's not... We're not talking about a guy off the street. We're talking about an MMA champion, and he's built like like a monster. Yeah. So And he came and really tried to win. And it, it was a very, a very impressive effort he gave. He's very athletic. Very athletic. A lot better than people expected. And, 
you know, I, I, I believe I'm just like Steve, and we've had this conversation, Steve, many, many times. We don't believe in fucking tune-ups. You know, we I, I don't like tune-up fights. Those are the most danger, dangerous fights. Anything can happen. You know, because a fighter, the psyche of a champion, you know, you kind of train to the level of your opponent, mm -hmm. and you can tell that Fury just take, took it lightly. Again, you know? he didn't fight a lot. This was his first fight this year. I mean, I, look, I, I actually believe in tune-ups as long as they're regular. But if your tune-ups are coming every other year, it's called perpetual ring rust. Right. Yes. I mean, that, yes, that's just the reality. Yes. Eric, in your view, how sustainable or let me phrase this differently are these hybrid matches here to stay mma guys against established boxers and vice versa look there's a market for it i, I you know a lot of us were purists you know we want to see champion versus champion every time out or at least high level fights um look if they're as competitive as as they were this weekend there's a market for it people like that and and you know uh, it's good to see crossover fights you know i don't think i'll ever see a top level champion in, in boxing go to MMA. It's very, very different. But right. you know, you have a guy, a lot of guys in MMA that have a boxing background, or they've dabbled in it. You know, either as an amateur or they started off as boxers and went to MMA. So as long as it's competitive and you have a guy that, that's a good striker, you know, it's it's a spectacle. I I don't have a problem with it. I actually like it too. As a matter of fact, if like Fury. Um, is supposed to be fighting Usyk in December, but now I'm hearing that might February. get delayed until February. February. So as long as he fulfills his duties, I don't have a problem with these sort of fun, sort of uh, novelty fights. And you're right; it's always going to see you're always going to see the MMA athlete uh, transition over to the to boxing, um, more lucrative. I think it's great for the sport; keeps more eyes on it. Even those YouTube kids, I don't have a problem with it because again, as long as we're talking about it, and as and the, the, the sport is fractured as it is, the more people that are in it, more people that are doing it and talking about about it better for the sport yeah yes. well eric you have kids now that are like teenagers they're in high school what are they interested <laughs> in when it comes to boxing do they like the real boxing quote unquote real boxing do they like that influencer stuff hmm. well it's a little different because they grew up around right you know right. me and what i do so they know who the they know who the top fighters are but they also know the jake pauls in the world the KS, ksis you know they knew him before i i knew who they were sure you know and they were excited about those fights so Yes, Mario's right. You know, it's, as long as it's bringing more eyeballs to the sport, it's only better. You know, they're bringing different aspects to it, different sponsorships. Uh, you know, so it's just helping build the sport. My son, funny that you mentioned that. You know what he's going for his Halloween? He's going as a prime bottle. The prime energy drink bottle. <laughs> yeah. That's how much influence they have on yes. these kids. Is he wearing the yes. chain? No, dude, I'm talking the actual energy yeah, bottle. I got to yeah, find a big, yeah, the actual, prime. the prime, that's how yeah. much the, he's 10, he just turned 10. Mm. But my point is, that's how much influence they have this my, young kid. My daughter's like seven years old and she was drinking two of them yesterday. There you you know, know, she what? was alternating two prime and I was like, what is that? Yes, what, what are they doing that? to these kids? Yeah. That's the craziest thing. <laughs> Whatever they're doing is brilliant. I mean, I, I, I would just say nothing but you who, but again, I mean, <laughs> they must be jumping all over the like 100 years old yeah uh, <laughs> let's take a look at some of the golden boy business uh you guys had a really lively show at the forum a couple of weeks ago it was supposed to be this big moment for alexis rocha so mad i couldn't make it right and it didn't work out against uh, an inspired giovanni santian eric from your perspective you guys have done i thought a really good job of developing rocha keeping him active moving yep. him up the ladder starting to make some money mm -hmm. he's about to make a move what is that mood like when you have to go into the locker room and, and deal with this young man who thought, hey, look, I'm on the doorstep of a title shot. What, 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 what do you tell a young man like that? Well, it's hard. It's hard to deal with, you know, anytime you lose, especially the way he lost. Um, but I commend him, you know, because he wanted a real fight. And, and, you know, what we were doing behind the scenes and what a lot of people are not aware of is that fight should have been for either the vacant title or for an interim title mm -hmm. because... Crawford had announced that he was possibly going to move up and wait to 154. Mm -hmm. It didn't work out that way. Uh, we followed all the rules, all the regulations with the WBO. Ultimately, Crawford said he wants to still keep the title and that if he does do a rematch with Spence, it would have to be at 47. Mm -hmm. That's what he said at the during the convention with you know with WBO. Uh, obviously, look, he's a great fighter. Um, he deserves the position he's in. And he doesn't have to give up the title, and we weren't going to force him to do that. Uh, but having said that, we had set it up so that if he did vacate, 
Rocha would be fighting for a vacant title, and he had to fight one of the top guys there. Yeah. And and the next available was Santillan. So that's the reason why we did that fight. And look, it was Santillan's moment. You know, you can never measure a guy's heart and determination. You know, I saw like five videos, five of his fights, and I felt very strongly that Rocha should win. In fact, he was favored at one point. Four I to believe one. it was like, you know, it was like six to one at one point or something like that. Mm. You know, and a lot of money came in with Rocha. That's why it went down to four to one. <coughs> Eric, you know what I hate? And, and you know, uh, yeah. to piggyback on what, what you said too, you guys did do a great job with him. He was getting, he was keeping active. I got to see him fight a couple times. He looked better every time out. I thought this was like sort of a culmination of all that. And even in the fight, it wasn't like I saw a guy in Santillan that was that much better. Mm -hmm. Do you know what I mean? Does yeah. that make any sense? It wasn't like he was that much superior, much more superior in his skills. It just seems he got the better of the exchanges and yeah, the, yeah. the harder, more telling blows uh, landed. Yeah. So I want Rocha, uh, if I hope yeah. he's listening, to keep his head up because he's really, you know what I mean, still oh, on. He's going to get his shot Wilson. again. He's going to definitely. Absolutely. absolutely. We're, we're but with, do you understand with, what I'm saying? It wasn't like it was a fighter, like he looked, oh my God, it looked we're like he behind got him. More, yeah. behind him. We're behind him 100%. Uh, you know, it's, it's for me in the position we are at Golden Boy, it's always a pleasure to work with a kid like that. No headaches, no problems. Right. You tell him, fight this guy. He says, no problem. Send me a contract. He's always on weight. He's very professional. You just, he's a dream to work with. And you know what? Look, you fight the best and you lose. You know, there's nothing wrong with that. You know there's what I hate with that. is the people that are critical of this fight being made and say, well, Golden Boy got a guy knocked off. Well, here's the problem. If he would have beat someone lesser, they would have said, well, Golden Boy is just making setups. Like, you can't exactly. win. I, I don't, like, to me, do we want good fights or not? And boxing, don't you think Eric has to get out of the mindset? And this goes to managers, promoters, and even networks. Don't be afraid to get guys beat. That's no, part of the no. business. You need to no. take a page out of the UFC. And that's why yeah. they match them so difficult. They don't care. Guys lose all the time yeah. in the UFC. And because they realize that they're facing tough competition. Yeah. And the fans themselves is what I mean by the, they don't care. The fans themselves don't care because they know their match. We need to change that mentality for the public out there to realize that. Yeah. No, definitely. We had a call with the zone today. And they support him 100%. You know, they're proud of Alexis Rocha and... You know, he's going to get his shot again. He'll get his shot again, and we'll bring him back. And you're absolutely right, Steve. Look, <laughs> you can't win. Do you want good fights? Or not. Or do you want guys to, you know, do you want to right. be able to, you know, go and see a fight, and you're going to know the outcome before the bell even rings? You know, we, we're all about making good fights. Oscar wants to give the fans, you know, all their money's worth. And, and that's what we try to do. We try to put together good fights. And guess what? You're not always going to win. You know, we've been very fortunate this year. We've had some very, very good fights. Very good fights. And this just happens to be one that, you know, didn't go our way. But you know what? Five, six, ten of them have gone our way. Sure. Eric, uh, let's go back. I remember we hung out in Long Beach at the home of Lucius Harris, uh, Penny Toller at Long Beach, the yes. Pyramid. And that was the night where Zerto Ramirez was supposed to headline. But he only missed weight by about 20 pounds. First of all, <laughs> uh, he did come back against Joe Smith. So this is a two-part question. Number one, what were, were those discussions like with Zerto's management and himself? And what do you do with him now in the wake of that victory with Joe Smith as a cruiserweight? Well, I mean, it was very hard. Look, when a guy misses weight the day of the weigh-in, it's just, you know, it's tragic. And for a promoter, it's very, very hard. Um, I'm very... Happy to say we were able to keep the show going. Yes. You know, it was very, very hard. It was very difficult discussions with the zone because, you know, they're paying for something and all of a sudden you change it out there in the last minute and, you know, the programming's out there, the sure. marketing's behind it. So it's very hard to rescue a show and have it go forward. So I'm very proud that we were able to do that. Um, and yeah, look, with Surdo, his he's been making that weight for such a long time. He's a, he's a big kid. A big you guys kid. have met him. He's yeah. six yeah. two, pushing six three. Possibly, he's taller than us. He's, he's yeah. taller than us. He's very big, <laughs> and his body just shut down. You know, he just couldn't make weight. And I, it's happened to us in the past. It just, it's hard when it's the main event and that happens. Right. I thought he bounced back perfectly fine against against Joe Smith, the right style, a guy that was hmm. coming forward and sure. sort of though you know he, he he fought a great fight, and you know now he's in line to possibly fight for a world title. Yeah, and he fought a dangerous guy, a heavy-handed guy, and he looks really good and slick. He's he's very agile for being as big as he is and an athletic guy. So he's now committed to staying at at cruiserweight. He's, he's comfortable at cruiserweight. there. Yeah, he's going to stay at cruiserweight, and uh, 
we're discussing possibly fighting for the title next against the WBA champion, uh, our, our son. Gulaman. Our son. Yeah, Gulaman. Great. Yeah, exactly. And as far as um, Virgil Ortiz is concerned, yeah. I know we had some health issues that he was dealing with a kid that you were very high on, we were high on, really like him, nice kid. Um, what's the latest with him, and are there any um, dates set on a return yet? We're working on something for, for, for January, and uh, we're very close in finalizing all the details. We'll be making an announcement soon. But uh, he's, he's cleared medically 100%. Um, Good. You know, it's something that, uh, you know, he had no control over, um, but he got treatment for that. And, and as of now, right now, and I've been talking to his doctor, he's cleared 100% to fight. Um, Junior middleweight? Uh, yeah, he's going to be moving yes. up in weight. He's going to be moving right. up in weight. He's a big kid. You know, I yeah. mean, Virgil too. I mean, you know, it's like each time I see him, he keeps getting taller and bigger and, and you know, stronger. But um, yeah, he, we're, we're looking for a big year for him this year. And uh, nice. coming up. And speaking of big things, I believe one of the must see fighters in the world today. I, I like to say not only is he double parked, he's double parked while robbing a bank, just the way he fights. El Camarón, William Zapata. Oh, I love me some William Zapata. I, I saw him at Commerce Casino. This guy comes out throwing punches during warm ups, and he doesn't stop till they actually announce him the winner, and he, and he swarmed a really gutty Mercito Hesta. Yeah. I, I believe he's one of the top five lightweights yeah. in the world. So what's next for him? What an impressive We're gonna, we're gonna yeah. change his name from Camarón to the Piranha because this guy. <laughs> right? I mean, this guy just doesn't stop. He, he's it. just he's on you, and uh, we're excited about him. Yeah. We're very excited about him, and obviously, you know, everybody's calling out his name. Uh, you know, he's one or two fights away from you know fighting one of the top guys for a world title, and you know, if Tank wants any smoke, <laughs> let's do it. I well, hold on. There's another guy, though, that no one wants to get in the ring with. And I actually think that his activity and his style uh, would not be dissuaded. We've talked can about I guess, this. Can I guess? Yes. Shakur Stevenson. What do you think? Funny Ooh. funny enough, that's who William Cepeda wants. Oh, well, he wants really? Shakur Stevenson. For, for whatever reason, there's something he sees that we don't because, look, Shakur, Shakur's a, like a young Mayweather. Yeah. He really is. He's a young Mayweather, yeah. and he's probably... A better finisher than Mayweather, you know. I can't. I mean, I don't want to take away from Mayweather. He's a great fighter, one of the best of all time. But Shakur's got that that kind of talent. Mm -hmm. He's that good. You know, I just love the way he works his ring generalship. Uh, he works his distance well. Oh, yep. But for whatever reason, you know, if you look at Mayweather's career, who gave him problems? Castillo, 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 Castillo and Maidana. Oh, that's interesting. Castillo and Maidana. And, Maidana, that's and, interesting. and William Cepeda kind of fights. He throws more than. Either guy, Castillo really. Those guys, yeah. He throws more, but he's just constant, and he's on you, and he Ooh, changes. Really cool. He changes his height. Oh, oh, now you got me changes fired his up ankles. That fight. And, but there's something. There's something that William Cepeda sees. Yes. And he tells us, "We want Shakur. We want Shakur." So, we'll see. We'll and that's see if the that's kind of fight win. that I feel he'll look good. Regardless, win or lose, he'll look good, and his stock yes. will rise, and he has a very good shot. Of winning based on the analogy that you just gave, um, assuming of course is the same as a pair that we see always prepared, which he's he's continues to look to look great. But yeah, I was really high on him too. The last couple of times I've seen him, I'm like, ooh, this kid yeah. is must see TV. He's exciting, Mario. Yeah. He's exciting. He's just like a throwback guy. You know, yep. look, he knows he's gonna get hit. You know, he does his best to keep his hands up, but he's just so busy. I mean, you know, it's there's, an old, there's an old saying in boxing that you know the best defense is a great offense. <laughs> Man, you know, he's just like that. Mario, really when good. I was there at the Commerce Casino for that fight against Hester, there was a particular moment in round two where they separated and Mercito actually took like a deep breath, like, oh. And I said, oh and my God. That's a savvy veteran. And like I said to myself, if that happens in round two, if you're getting water in your lungs and you're five miles out from shore, you're in trouble. No, exactly. That, that's the thing. And I'm like, oh boy. Because usually if that happens in round 10, you could kind of like, you know, take a spin around the block. I said, Mercito, I love you. you. We're in trouble here. Right. Mabuhai. No, exactly. <laughs> no. Mabuhai, yeah. Next time, next time he fights, uh, I definitely want to be there because that is, uh, that is must see TV, like I said. Yeah. Salute to him. Salute. <laughs> Another salute. someone we will be able to see um, on TV December 2nd in Houston, return of Ryan Garcia. Going yeah. up against a tough kid with Oscar Duarte. What's the latest? You know, I, I give I give Ryan a lot of credit. You know, we were going through names, and um, there was a possibility at one point we were going to go after Adrian Broner, which is a great name oh, for him. What? 
it's a good fight. It's a great name. And mm-hmm. we had some conversations with Don King and, the, the, you know, the, Don King spoke to Oscar directly. Come on, let's get it on. And, wow. It was great. Only in America. And, uh, Eric Gomez. Yeah. And, All right, uh, Kim. And, uh, <laughs> but for whatever reason, uh, Broner didn't want it at this time. Broner said that, you know, he was going to do a tune-up fight first. Happy to explore it early next year. So as we were going through names, you know, Duarte's name came up. Mm. And I was very, very surprised that they brought it up and it came from it came from Ryan. Huh. So there's something that Ryan sees again like these fighters they have their own vision they they see things that sometimes we don't see. Right. Uh but you know he said Duarte and he wanted Duarte and you know he just feels that you know he can exploit that and I can see you know uh, Ryan's got fast hands Duarte does get hit. Um, but he's he also heavy handed. He's also very heavy handed. Yeah, he's very it, dangerous. It could be dangerous. That's what he's makes very, the fight. Well, I respect dangerous. him too to be able to jump right back into the deep waters yeah. with that. When you're trained by Joel Diaz, uh, I expect a soldier that's going to be well trained and ready to walk through some fire. Now, I have a yeah. question in terms of the relationship. I know you can't say a lot. There's some litigation, but I, I really felt that at the beginning of the year, as the Ryan Garcia Tank Davis fight was being negotiated and consummated, we went to the whole promotion. I did not feel that Ryan Garcia and Golden Boy were on not only the same page, but the same book. You may have not been in the same encyclopedia set. <laughs> Where does that relationship stand right? Because I saw some pictures in Houston. Seemed like you guys were getting along pretty well. You're simpatico. I mean, where does it stand, that relationship right now? You know, it's funny because um, I, the best way to describe it is, you know, there's just some misunderstandings and some communication breakdowns. Um and, uh, you know, if you get together and talk and communicate, you know, you'd be surprised how much you can get through to people and give your point of view. And, you know, he gave his point of view. And I think that we're in a place right now where we can move forward and keep working. Um, look, we were able to get December done. And, and uh, he, he wants to keep fighting. And he wants to fight the best. And we want to keep promoting his fights. So that's what we're going to do. Um, Look, you know, I mean, at the end of the day, he's a professional, we're professionals, Oscar's a professional as well, and we can put all that stuff aside and just keep moving forward and do do great business. And correct me if I'm wrong, but there always seems to be individuals who are in people's ears who think they have their best interest, uh-huh. want to look out for them theoretically, don't know what the hell they're talking about. Don't necessarily have any experience here. Why would you not listen to people who want to guide your career, your promoters, your f- the fighter, the champion who's already been there? And these fighters, and I'm not talking about Ryan in general, but because it happens to a lot of other fighters, but they'll listen to these outside influences and they'll let it have an effect on them, which is the weirdest thing. Must be the most frustrating thing for you to have to deal with, right? It is, but unfortunately, it's it's part of our business. It's part of our business, and you know. It, it, when you do your well, if you, when you do your job well, exceptionally well, it's unfortunate because you build a guy and, and you make him a big star like we've done with Ryan and Oscar. Canelo. Oscar, Oscar personally guess, yeah. like took him under his wing and you know put him pretty much on his back and, and used his his influence and, and and you know everything our platform, uh, Oscar's brand, everything behind him. And you're always going to get the naysayers. You're going to get people from all walks of life. And now with social media, anybody can reach anybody. Right. You know, and, you know, they can say all these things to these fighters. And these fighters just, they don't have the time to verify sometimes. And they just go with it. Right. Eric, did you guys come to a point in terms of the parameters of the Tank Davis fight with the lower weight and all that other stuff that was attached to it? And then he didn't take the Mercito Hesta fight in late January. Were you in a position as a company where you and Oscar just had to say, okay, Ryan, if this is what you want, we will acquiesce? Yeah, Ryan basically said, look, guys, just get it done. This is what I want. I don't want a lot of back and forth. You know, Ryan, uh, again, when Ryan makes a decision, he's got tunnel vision. And he wanted Tank. He didn't care about any other name or nothing. He just had that tunnel vision, and he wanted Tank. He wanted Tank. He wanted Tank. And we went over the details. Oscar was against the weight. Oscar kept telling him, let me do my job. I don't agree with right. the weight. It's, you know, and there's penalties and this and that, steep penalties. Um, I don't agree with this. I don't agree with this. And Ryan said, basically, Oscar, please just get it done. Just get it done. Which ties your hands this. and now you have no leverage. You know, so <laughs> if, right. if, if you know? the fighter, if, you know, the way these big fights get done is because the fighters want them. 
That's it, you know, because if they don't want them and they let these other little things get in the way, it could break up a fight. But, you know, for whatever reason, Ryan, you, he just wanted to fight. He had tunnel vision. I respect that. I respect that. You know, he had his own ideas and his own you know, interpretation of what was happening with the fight. Ultimately, it backfired. You know, I think the weight affected him. Yeah. I, did, I think it weakened him. I thought that he had all the leverage if we would have fought at a better weight class. But for whatever reason, look, he wanted it. We made it happen. It was successful uh, monetarily for him. Yeah. Um, and, uh, you know, you just got to live with your decisions. As far as the uh, future with, with um, Golden Boy, uh, Eric, hearing a lot of different things, possible mergers, possible streaming services that might be aligned with, what can you share? All I can share is that, you know what, we're going to keep moving forward, man. We're going to keep moving forward. Oscar, Oscar wants the company to be, you know, uh, the best promotional company in, in the world. And, and he's going to keep working towards that. And you know Oscar personally. You know the way he is. You know, when he has his mind wrapped around something and, you know, so there's a lot of things. We've been approached as well. Um, look, you know, we just want to be able to make great events, great events, whether, you know, it's with, you know, other people investing in the company or mergers or whatever. We just want to keep doing the best. You know, awesome. Eric, it's interesting about the changing landscape of boxing and content and television. Just from a personal view, your thoughts on Showtime boxing ending after a 37 year run. It, it hurts. It hurts us. It hurts the sport. It's not good for us. You know, I mean, look, you know, yeah, they did a great job. They did an incredible job. You know, it, it's historic what they did. Very similar to when HBO went out. You know, it was heartbreaking. Um, you know, uh, you don't want to see that. Uh, you know, the more boxing there is, the more big events, the more big name fighters, it just helps build the sport. You know, when you lose an entity like like Showtime, it's not good for us. It's not good for us. And, you know, you can, you can nitpick and say, well, this happened, that happened. No one really knows what happened. Um, but, you know, the bottom line is, at the end of the day, they're not in boxing and... It's not good for us. You but know, I'm, sure, I'm sure there's going to be other platforms that come up. There's other people that are going to want to do boxing. You know, uh, it do, was do, in many ways, show, you know, Showtime and HBO, they're the holy grail for boxing. Right. They, they were, and they're do, no longer here. Do you see a future in a streaming service? Yeah, I mean, they, they have the ability to do that. Of course they can. You know, they can do it. Uh, Max, Max just announced that they're going to be doing sports as well. So I'm sure they're, they might they might dabble and do something as well. So right. That'd be ironic. I mean, they, they, I mean you know, they, their, their, archive, their archive is incredible. Yeah. I mean, you know, they, they were a staple. They were a cornerstone for our sport for many, many years. And you can't ignore that. You can't ignore yeah. that. You know, Steven Espinosa, love or hate him, he did a lot of great things for boxing. The experience that he has, the things that he's went through, you know, I can see him maybe ending up somewhere else and, and, and driving them. Uh, he's got the ability to do that. Eric, I, the question, and I've said this for a while, is that the problem is that the, the sport was so fractured. There was essentially four leagues, ESPN, The Zone, Showtime. Regardless of how the landscape of content is disseminated, you guys have to be willing to reach across the aisle and work with one another, right? Of course. That's that. That's the bottom line, that, no matter that's, who's... That's, that's what Oscar's been yeah, preaching. He's that's been what preaching he's been that, saying exactly. that. And look, Steve, I've talked to you. I've known you for many, many years. I've talked to you. Oh, we have an open door. We are willing to work with everybody. Mm -hmm. You're going to win some. You're going to lose some. We just did, you know, we did Ryan Garcia with Tank Davis. Right. We lost that fight, but Ryan's probably a bigger star now. Absolutely. Than he was before. And everyone you won know? financially. Exactly. We just did top rank right now with Rocha. Yep. We lost that. Yep. Okay, but guess what? It was like one of the fights of the year. Exactly. It was It was a great fight, a great event. You know, those fights were there. Good. We have to be able to work with each other. The problem is, is that a lot of these promoters, they're just, they're so afraid to lose. You know, but if you put up good fights, good fighters, nobody loses. Everybody wins. Yeah. Exactly. Everybody uh, wins. A That's rising tide lifts all vessels. Right. Uh, this is something me and you have talked about in private at length. I I'm actually alarmed by the lack of activity of fighters today. And I don't actually blame the fighters. I think it's a lot of the system, but I think a lot of it has to do with the managers, that they are so set on the minimum that they won't budge. Eric, how frustrating is it for you to try to keep certain fighters more active 
and you guys are saying, hey, we'll, you, you can bring your own opponent. We're going to make you look good. But the manager says, oh, no, but if we don't get this amount, it doesn't matter. And, and here's my thing. Would you rather be inactive for nine months or take a fight in between that that's going to make you look good and you still get a payday and it's going to help you make more money down the line? Because Oscar did that in 1997 with five fights as the biggest name in boxing. And what Bob Arum and Oscar both told me was every fight we started off at zero. There was no set amount. How frustrating is it for you that the current system and the managers today do not allow activity? How do we change it is, that? It is. You're right. You're right. Look, uh, what we do it with us, with our fighters, is we make it known to them. Okay, yeah, you're going to have your minimum number of fights. You're going to have your minimum pay. But additionally, we might we may offer you a, a smaller in between, fight. In between in fights. In between fights, smaller fight. I don't like to say tune-up because I just yeah. don't like that. That word, But yeah. yeah, but in between fight. you know, And it's up to you whether you want to do it or not. Some fighters have. Some fighters have said, yes, you know what? I want to stay busy. I want to do that. I want to stay sharp. You know, we just saw it with Fury this weekend. Right. You know, think about it. You know, but they're just so tied up with making the most money, you know. Uh, but Eric, and all. But, but here's but, the thing. But, 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 but to defend Fury, he's an established fighter. So that's fine. I'm just talking about okay. like the guys on the way up, though. No, but they're to, even to, to, to piggyback your point, though, it's so short sighted. Because even uh, going back to uh, the example you gave with Oscar, it was building his brand. Even if he wasn't making as much money he's to out say there. this fight, he's out there. He's getting known. The awareness level is getting higher. People want to see him. That could be the case. I, do you have these conversations with these fighters? I'm, and I'm sure you do, but they must get frustrating because like, look at the big picture because as you grow, you're going popular, you're going to want because if you're out of sight, you're out of mind, you're, you're, your value you're is, not, is going right. to diminish. Yeah, yeah. Mario, can I make a point with you and Eric? You guys are both Dodger fans. You guys get to see them 162 games a year. And Mario, when you go to a Dodger game and you enjoy yourself, you never say, oh, but that's a fourth place team. No, no, no. You still get to see them. Yeah. In boxing, <laughs> me and Tino on the way up, I said, Tino, punch up the uh, Ring Magazine top 10. Do you know that half the top 10 of a Ring Magazine did not fight even more than twice? That's all I'm saying is that, see, when fighters say we need a seat at the table, and when Oscar was going back with Terrence Crawford, mm -hmm. and I love Terrence, and Ryan said, we need a seat at the table. And I said, okay, well, why do you need a seat at the table? Are you going to address your own inactivity? The, the, see, here's the problem. There's no other industry in sports that tells their best fighters and their biggest stars, hey, guys, you're not going to even be seen twice this year. It doesn't work. Mm. Yeah. It does it right. I mean, am I right or wrong? Yeah, 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 you're right, yeah. It's hard to do business. That way, right. right. It's hard to do business. It's hard to keep a, a schedule, which is what the sponsors like, which is the networks like. You right. know, you have to have a schedule for these fighters. But you're absolutely right. You know, they've got it in their head. I got to go and make the most money each time. Every I time. Fight. Every time out. And it doesn't work like that. And Mario, have you ever gone to a Dodger game and said, "Yeah, Dodgers won," but God, it was, it was the fifth place team. No, you went to a Dodger game. You enjoyed it. Yeah. That's it, my point. It, well, my point was for the managers and the people that are discouraging the inactivity, it's incredibly short-sighted. You're not looking at the big picture. You're doing a disservice to your fighter and the fighter himself not staying as sharp, not making as much money. Not staying in the public eye. Not staying in the public eye. It's really a bizarre thing to kind of witness. Real quick, before I forget, you mentioned Max a little earlier. Bro, you were excellent in the documentary. You did a really, really uh, good job. I, 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 yeah, you he? Stole he did show. a really good I, job. I, I say you stole the There's show. whispers now they're wanting to HBO's wanting to nominate for um should oh. we go for the other well, Emmy? Congratulations or to you, Emmy. Mario. Well, thank, you, you. thank you. <laughs> so I'm really proud of the way it turned out. You did a really, really good job. What kind of feedback did you get from people? You did a good job, Mario. You thank did you. a good job <laughs> producing. He was yeah. a coordinator. He was a thank coordinator. You, thank you. What kind of feedback did you get? It was good. You know, for look, this was this was Oscar. This was for Oscar, and Oscar wanted this to be this way and <clears throat> in a lot of ways, you know, it was therapy for him. I feel that, you know, just through my conversations, he wanted to get it out. He, you know, he said, look, I, there's things that I've kept inside. And so it was very therapeutic for him. And from in many ways, it was therapeutic for us as well. It was therapeutic for us as well. Um, you know, I love him like a brother. You know that. We've been together for many, many years. Um, some of us were very critical of him. Um, but it, it was for him. This was for him, and, and I just hope that, uh, and I've seen it, it makes him a better person from it. I know it's made me a better person. Um, and yeah, you know, we got a lot of good feedback and all that because, you know, we just didn't, you know, it wasn't, 
before I even got interviewed, I, I asked Oscar, look, you know, is there certain things you want me to touch on or not? And he said, Eric, I want it to be real. Ooh. Yeah, well, it was <laughs> Let real. your hands go. It was, he said, yeah, he said, <laughs> hands he said I want it to be raw. I want it to be authentic. You were in those meetings, Mario. Yeah. He said that. He said, I want it to be raw. I want it to be real. I want it to be authentic. And that's what it's so, Eric. And that's what I try to portray. And I did that, um, you know. And I love him, and, and, and you know, and, and I think that, you know, you have to have some compassion for someone like that because at the end of the day, he's lived an extraordinary life. You know, he's a celebrity. It's very different than us regular people. Yeah. Um, and, and, you know, and his experience was very different than what we experienced. Uh, you've lived it as well, Mario. You're a celebrity. You get attacked. You know, people, as much as people love you, they attack you as well. And, and you know, but they don't know you. They don't know you. They see you on TV. They think they know you. But at the end of the day, you know, you, you have your own life and your own truths. You know, so it was just, it was, it was beautiful to see Oscar finally getting a lot of that stuff out. And I love the person he's become now. And, and it's almost like he, he had a weight lifted off of him. And, and, you know, it did its job. Awesome. Eric, this is a question from Glitter Road. Clay Stevenson, one of our biggest fans, he wanted me to ask you this a couple of weeks ago when you were supposed to come. Why were you in a classroom, and which classroom was it in? Uh, <laughs> <laughs> um, let me see. Was it a class? No, they just sat me like on a desk. It, it was, was like on a desk. It was, we it, was in, it was in downtown LA. It was like yeah, in a yeah. building somewhere. We were, I, I guess, think we yeah. were coming off of okay. a Garfield High shot and the editing. Mm, we had yeah. Him, yeah, I did. I go, well, it was it a yeah. Gar yeah. Garfield <laughs> High, the second best high school in East LA, obviously obviously behind Montebello Ooh, yeah. High. Eric, did you learn anything <laughs> from the documentary when you watched it? Like, oh, I didn't know that. Anything revealing? Yeah. Yeah. Yes. Can you tell us? <laughs> <laughs> um, <coughs> uh, you know, whoa, <laughs> that's a good question. Uh, just some of the feelings, the personal feelings that Oscar's had. Hmm. Uh, towards certain people or certain situations that were very telling because as much as and as close as I am to him and I've been throughout these years, there's certain things that he keeps to himself. There's certain things he keeps to himself. Um, and uh, to hear him come out and talk about him and say him and, 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 and give his, his truth because that is his truth. That's what he believes. Um, it was very, very tally and, and 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 i learned from it i learned from it eric we were at a f la rams tailgate years ago i remember el razo yeah. our boy razo threw a great tailgate yes and the rams, does. Yeah, yeah, and we're razo. still playing a call theme and you told me an interesting story that you you and oscar or some other kids would be playing basketball and his father would say get your ass you're not going you know, to be in the nba yeah pick yeah. that up i found that to be fascinating yeah we were we were uh we were like in junior high and we would, you know, I would, on the weekends, I would skateboard over to his house and we would go to the elementary school that we went to as kids and we would go either play basketball or we would be messing around with the skateboards. Yeah. Sometimes we would go to the park and we would play baseball or tackle football with no pads. You know, that's yeah. what you did <laughs> of <course>. as kids. <laughs> um, and, um, and his dad would always come around. His dad, we would see that Monte Carlo coming down and Oscar would try to hide behind <laughs> yeah. a tree or whatever. And he would, you know, he would just whistle or he'd be, he'd be upset. And Oscar would just, come on. And I'd be like, and he's like, I got to go. I got to go train. And Oscar would go and jump the fence and, you know, and get in the car. And I'd be like, but wait a minute, what about Joel? Who cares about Joel? <laughs> jo so, I'm kidding. I'm kidding. I'm kidding. But I'm kidding. But no, but Joel would be allowed to stay with us because yeah, he, yeah. he had stopped boxing. So Joel was, you know, jo Joel was older than us, and, you know, a couple of years older, and he was the bigger kid. So he was our linebacker. So we needed him in the yeah. team. You know, he, he, needed, he would tackle everybody for us. But anyway, but yeah, so it, it was, yeah, like, you know, the discipline that his dad instilled in him, I feel personally is part of the reason why he, Oscar was so driven. You know, he instilled that discipline from a young age, very, very young age, you know, yeah. and, and, you know, and Oscar's right. You know, he would wake up at four thirty, five in the morning to go jog. And, you know, and I would, I would run into him sometimes jogging on the weekends. He'd be jogging around the cemetery, jogging around the cemetery. You know, Mario, the one thing that I took away from your production, because I've known... I've known the family for a while, from a distance. 
It's the first time I ever saw a softness in the father where he said, my son did it. Like he was actually proud of him. I don't think people have talked about it, but I know people that actually know Joel Sr. very well. Like the guy loves his horses, his gambling, his boxing. But the way he cheered up about his son at certain points, I said, you know what? He gets it now. It's a very, that's one of the things that. He's, he's always, Steve, he's always got it. He's but, always, uh, but, he you, know, you, but, 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 you, you know, look, look, you're not a parent. Yeah. You love, you love your, you love of your course. kids. Of course. Yeah. But, you know, but he also, you know, the, the Oscar's dad is, you know, he, he really is a genius. You know, he's a smart person because he knew that he was putting his son in harm's way in a sport, in a blood sport. And he knew that he could not, you know, there's a saying in Mexico, there's a saying in Mexico, and, and, and it holds true to this day, the best fighters in the world are orphans. Yeah. That's what they say in Mexico, mm -hmm. okay? Los mejores peleadores son huérfanos. And he knew that if he gave his son hugs and high fives each time he was work. successful, mm -hmm. it wouldn't work. So he had that tough persona. He was stone-faced and he wouldn't give Oscar credit. I think he was like a man genius. A, he, was, he, was a, he was a genius. You know, he I, was a genius because I think that's what helped drive him. Exactly. And, and uh, regarding what you're saying, and I think you're getting at, and it, that's the part that struck a chord with me too, because Oscar and I are the same age, and our dads are like roughly around the same age. That generation too, just they're not it's a tough. They're just not hug, big <laughs> hug. Like Oscar, they're not Oscar's, very Oscar's dad. Oscar's dad had a hard life, man. I mean, yeah. he really did. You talk to him. He came out here with with. 10 cents in his pocket. Yeah. You so know, it's to hard the United to States, show that. Yeah, to make no. it. You know what I mean? You know I mean? I mean, he, if you, you sit down and talk to Oscar's dad, like he had it hard. Yeah. And he knew that if his kids were going to be successful, he had to be hard on them. That's exactly and, right. And you know what? And, and, you know, look, I see it with my kids. You know, I'm a parent now and, you know, and, you know, we, it's, you know, you want to give them hugs and kiss them and all, but at the same time, you got to kind of kick them out of the nest <laughs> and be like, hey. Go get it. You know what? Yeah. And no one's gonna love you as much as we do. And there's gonna you're gonna run into some people out there that, that are that are you know that are be very critical. That are gonna be evil and bad. And you know, especially in boxing. No, oh, exactly. Well, boxing, well right? our kids are growing up very different the way that we did. Yeah. Right. So it so it's so it's 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 tough balance and it's. It's a tough line to cross, but the love the was always line. there. It's a, it's a fine line. line to cross, but the love was always there. The just not, it's just there. not expressing it. As right. I think but I do saying. think he but finally I think really he did. expressed it. That's what I, I knew yeah. you were getting at. Yes, exactly. Uh, we got to wrap this up here, but Eric, I've always been fascinated by your journey because I, I've, I've known you for about 25 years. I remember when you were running the gym, and yeah. I, I, I see like documentary footage from what Mario produced with yeah. Mr. Wahlberg, and you're one of the friends, you're one of the homies, but you were more than that. And I remember for a long time, you'd be that guy at, you'd see at a 7-Eleven restocking the Frito-Lay thing, because you were a working yeah, guy. You are just did, a regular yeah. guy. But you were like Oscar. You know, you know it's a funny thing about the Frito-Lay thing. I, only, I worked there for three years, three years at Frito-Lay. It was a great job when mm -hmm. I was 19. I've been in boxing for 26 years, but everybody always refers well, to the Frito Lay well, thing. Yeah, well, well, <laughs> what, what did you do at 19? No, well, yeah, yeah. Are you, are you, you know, you worked at. Well, but there's no job. There's no job in boxing. Says, hey, boxing. Like you kind of like everyone I've known in boxing. Their college degree <laughs> right, right, right. never I've, actually. I've had balls. I've had right. Yeah. I, I, yeah. Yeah. So. But that's the thing, though. Everyone I know in boxing at the upper level, no one ever went to college to be in boxing. That's the truth. Every mm -hmm. every executive went to do something else. What is your life like if you decide, I'm not gonna go with Oscar, I'm not gonna be the loyal lieutenant, or if Oscar brings me on? What do you think you're doing now if it's not boxing? Uh, you know what? Um Frito-Lay? Yeah, yeah, that's a good job. Yeah, running, running yeah, Frito-Lay. Frito yeah, you know, regional yeah. manager, right? Yeah. You, know? Uh, you know what, I love what I do right now, and, and I, I like to believe that I'm pretty good at it, um, but you know, probably go to law school, finish law school. I, mm. I always thought about, you know, oh. being an attorney. Um, you know, I'm pretty good with contracts now. <laughs> I've been doing it for, I've been doing it for 25 years or so. But yeah, look, um, one of the things that I appreciate that Oscar did, and maybe he did it accidentally, mm. is I started from the bottom. I mean, I started with amateurs. And I started at the youth center with yep. amateurs, mm -hmm. and and just really learning the sport, learning the style. Uh, you know, uh, that was key. That was very, very key. And 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 the psyche of a fighter. I mean, because you see these kids, you know, they're they're you know twelve, thirteen, fourteen years old, and seeing what they go through and the amount of 
preparation and, and the diet. I mean, 12 years old, think about that. And they have to diet and make weight yeah, when they go to these big national tournaments yeah. and they have to weigh themselves pretty much every I day. see kids in my wrestling in tournament. Wrestling, kids, you exactly, see that. Yeah. So, so, you know, so I started from the bottom. And even mm-hmm. when we started Golden Boy Promotions in 2002, you know, I, I did every single job. Yeah. You know, I used to go pick up the fighters from the airport. I remember. He would unfold the, the, the metal chairs. chair I remember, that club I remember. <laughs> And the matchmaking for a while, too. Every, which good. Yeah. Every, I started matchmaking from, from the get-go. And, and you know, um, I just appreciate that was, my, that was my education into boxing. And I learned yeah. it. And I've done everything. I've done everything. You know, I dress up the ring. Uh, you know, did the bring medical the exams. Bring the gloves. <laughs> Uh, you name it. You Pick know, up I, fighters I, I, from the hotel no, or the airport. Not, not only that, I did the hotel reservations. I did the, air, the flight reservations. I mean, I did it all. I did everything. Whether Oscar realized it or not, or it was done accidentally, I, I, I thank him for that because that was my education. That was my schooling into boxing. And I did mm. that, and I've been doing it for 26 years. I only did Frito Lay for three fucking years. <laughs> hey, can't three it. fucking like, years. It's a real job. I though. was 19. Three I was 19, <laughs> 20, 21, and I still hear that shit. Oh, you, <laughs> that guy used to sell. Hilarious. That guy used to fucking sell chips. <laughs> Fuck you, <laughs> dude. That's hilarious. Hey, there's no better feeling than you get to come up with your yeah. friends, and you and your friends win together. That's the best feeling in the world, man. And I'm glad he hooked you up because you are a great promoter. Thank you. And uh, I look forward to the future, man. Because it's bright. Yep. Movie Kevin, it's bright. Thank you. Thank Eric, you. before you get out of here, what can we expect from... Before, Vol- before you get out of here, you got any chips? <laughs> yeah, get any, get any, get any Doritos? Hot Cheetos, hot Cheetos. Hot Cheetos, hot Cheetos. Yeah. Uh, Eric, what can we expect from Golden Boy moving on for the next couple of months? Hey, you know what? Just great things. You know, we, we, uh, we're, we're, plan- we're planning some great fights. Uh, we're already planning the first quarter, so just stay tuned. All our big name fighters are going to be fighting. Okay, hold on. I forgot. I'm one hearing thing. good rumors. Right, Super Bowl yeah. weekend. Uh, I'm just yep. putting it out there. Mungia, real quick. What's going on with Mungia? We're working on Mungia. I've Munguia's been seeing him a wild He's working with uh, Freddie now. Yeah, he's working with Freddie now. He just had a baby, so congratulations, oh, congratulations to Mungia. Yeah. His, his yeah. first baby. Yeah. Yeah. Nice, yeah. nice um, kid. Really yeah, like him. Another so guy who's big. Yeah, he keeps getting bigger. Yeah, he's a great kid, and. We're looking for great things for him this year coming up. Uh, we're just, you know, we're, we're, you're going to have to stay tuned for the announcements, but we're working on some great things. And look, Oscar's doing some stuff on the side as well. Um, you know, again, uh, Oscar's very driven, all of us. You know, we feed off of him, and uh, we'll see. All right, well, look, limit. we've awesome. made Mario very late, and Eric, we're finally glad we got you in studio. Thank you're you, a slippery you. guy, man. I'm just telling yeah, you. Yeah, yeah, just busy. <laughs> Thanks for taking the time, man. Busy's good, busy, though. Yeah, yeah. All right, so on behalf of Mario Lopez, we'd like to thank everyone that made this show possible. Smoke and Tim Frazier and Tino. Tino on the edits. On behalf of USC Fight Pass and Hustler Casino and Scout Micro LA and BoxBid.io. Till the next round, goodbye, everybody.